How's everybody doing today? Um, well, we're going to give a talk today on OP4 and, and kind of what that means and what that acronym stands for and how um, kind of historically forensics folks and incident responders don't get, or excuse me, and uh, pen testers don't really get along all that well. Um, different circles, different backgrounds. Obviously, Tim and I look like we come from two very different, uh, very different backdrops. But we're all kind of after the same goal. So how do we, um, how do we use each other's skills to become better at, at, at what it is that we do? A um, little bit of background on me. Um, I'm sure you can tell. Uh, I, I was a hacker for. No. I was a U.S. Army officer for 13 years. Uh, I used to blow stuff up, which is really cool. Uh, but uh, there's not a big civilian market for um, demolitions experts. So uh, I became, uh, I was a warrant officer. Um, I worked uh, on criminal investigations with CID, moved into the cyber world, um, and then uh, became part of the X-Force, which, which IBM systematically destroyed. And then, uh, then I, uh, I moved over to Spider Labs. Um, been working on investigations in the cyber world for about 10 years, um, have a master's degree in information security, um, and, and so I get to work a lot on that side of the house. Tim, Tim's background is a little different, and you'll hear about that in a minute. Um, so this, the state of incident response, is this my Okay. Uh, state of incident response is, if you're an incident responder, right, you're kind of trying to think of the best way to word it. You are called into organizations to figure out what happened, right? You have little experience with complex attack signatures. You don't understand pivot points. You don't understand beachheads. You don't understand multi-layered attacks um, because it's just not your background. Um, so trying to understand those is, is, can be very, very difficult. Um, and you, a lot of incident responders don't really have a support mechanism behind them that they can reach back to and say, hey, can you explain this to me? In addition, and I'll say this straight out, most folks like me are kind of jerks, right? You've got a lot of, of ex-military, a lot of former law enforcement or, or current, and they've kind of got this alpha male, I'm better than you are syndrome, and it really rubs folks like pen testers the wrong way. So you don't get a lot of help. Um, so it's really tough to, to digest logically some of that material to aid your investigation, right? Um, so, and, and so Tim's going to discuss a little bit here about pen testing. So, hello, <clears throat> my name is Tim Maletic, and I'm a senior security, uh, uh, a senior security consultant with the network penetration testing team in Trustwave Spider Labs. I've been in IT since '91. I've been doing full-time infosec since 2001. I've been doing for the last three years nothing but penetration testing. And over that time, the penetration testing um, industry and, it, it, and the practice has seen incredible growth and maturation. And, um, but I think along the way, we've lost touch a little bit with some of our roots. If you think back to you know, what we're really trying to do in penetration testing, it's about modeling a real world attack. But the, maybe the commoditization of our industry of our product has uh, put some additional constraints on what we do and I think um, we're getting pushed in some directions where we get um, what I think of as artificial uh, distinctions forced on us about things like internal versus external, um, technical versus social, uh, what's in scope, what's in out of scope. So uh, I think there's some issues there that I would like to address one of my goals here is to direct some constructive criticism against what's going on in penetration testing today by returning to the roots of you know, what black hats really do. Also, I think kind of lurking under the covers here is some issues with how we talk about vulnerabilities in the first place. So if you think about the work product of penetration testing, you know, what's the artifact that penetration testers produce? It's really just a bunch of words. It's a bunch of documents, it's findings that are cached in terms of vulnerabilities and the systems that we use for talking about vulnerabilities, I mean, those systems were put in place like pre-code red. Um, and I think if you look at what's going on today, there's some places where it's out of touch and it is in serious need of a reboot. And so I'll be talking about that. But um, lately, Chris and I have been working on some projects where penetration testing and incident response kind of bump up against each other and we've been kicking some thoughts around I think we might have some ideas about potential solutions 
Absolutely. So what does Op4 stand for? Well, when I was in the military, specifically in, in uh, uh, the field artillery, it's, it's called opposing forces, right? The concept is you train as you fight. And if you want to be successful on the battlefield, you better be successful in training. Well, what I've seen a lot of in, in the penetration testing world is y'all have a bunch of rules put on you. You can't attack this, and this is out of scope, and you can't attack that, and you can't touch this piece of critical infrastructure, and you can only attack between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., right? How many black hat real life attackers play by rules? Well, none of them, right? So handcuffing your pen testers really doesn't do any good. Um, so what we want to do is, is use this methodology to help folks actually train as they would actually defend their networks, right? Play by the same rules the bad guys do, and in some cases that means you don't play by rules. Right? You do what you got to do to take the systems down, and as defenders, you better figure out how to defend. Because if you don't, someone's going to identify that vector, and they're going to take your systems offline or steal card data or healthcare information or whatever. And it's, it's a throwback to the day of being a hacker. Right? It's, it's not about being a pen tester and playing by rules in this corporate environment, but it's about do you want to be secure or do you want to check boxes? If you want to check boxes, this is the wrong place to be. This is the wrong career path. If you want us to beat down your door and tell you how we're going to get in and where we're going to get in, that's true security. Right? We understand there's compliance, we understand there's a security, and they are not mutually exclusive. We're interested in making you secure, not compliance necessarily, where you could just say, oh yes, I checked this box, therefore I'm secure. Right? Doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So it's this throwback to this, this honest to goodness, I'm going to beat your door down way of being a hacker. Okay, so naturally penetration testing can be viewed uh, as providing training for incident responders. Lots and lots of cases that we work involve threat vectors that I've never seen before. It's, it's new or it's emerging or it's, hey, it's this utility that I've never seen before. As a forensic investigator, I don't have to be a technologies expert, right? That's kind of ancillary to me. I'm really good at spotting patterns and anomalies. Now, if I find something that, that matches a pattern of something that I, I know, right, then I can say, hey, this is this specific pattern. Or if I spot an anomaly, I can say to Tim, hey, Tim, I have no idea what this anomalous behavior is, but I know it's not normal. Can you help me figure this out? That's where pen testers will come in and say, hey, we've got this particular tool leaves this particular signature, and that's what you got. Now, I, as an investigator, have another piece to my puzzle that I can incorporate and start to really frame the story of what took place. Right? Without that knowledge, without that capability, I would be stuck right there, miss a piece of crucial evidence, and potentially never solve the case. Right? But what's overlooked is that it does work both ways. Right? As uh, pen testers, there's a whole lot you can learn about the way I go to work every day, about the information that I find and, and, and the artifacts that are left behind that you can use to become a better pen tester. So that's kind of the solution. Right? So, do you have anything to add on that? No? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about my methodology. If you're in the forensics world, hopefully you've heard this term before. Um, it's a methodology that we developed in the Spider Labs called Sniper Forensics. In contrast to what's kind of traditionally been called shotgun forensics, which is an outdated methodology that I think is garbage. Um, it is, hey, let's image everything, pull the plug, throw it into your forensic software of choice, cross your fingers, and hope to find evil. Right? Doesn't work like that. You have to take a targeted approach that's very deliberate, going after very specific data elements that will help you uh, figure out what happened, piece by piece, in a logical, methodological approach. Right? So it's, it's finding what's called indicators of compromise. What are the IOCs? for specific vectors. What's an IOC for infiltration? What's an IOC for specific kinds of SQL injection? What's an IOC for privilege escalation attacks? Does it leave residual trace evidence behind and what can I use that evidence for to help build my, my picture of what took place, right? It, it, those elements are left behind. Regardless of what you do or how you do it, it's gonna leave trace elements, right? And then using that as actionable intelligence, which attacks are easily spotted? Well, obviously network scans are extraordinarily noisy on a network, right? Most everybody knows that. Um, versus which attacks are truly clandestine? Like, you know, using uh, a, a, a command line client instead of, you know, logging in interactively to the Windows shell, right? Two very, very different things. One of them, NTUser.dat gets updated. Um, you know, event logs get updated. You come in through a command line utility, right? You don't have those, those kind of updates. So really understanding, hey, what I do as a pen tester is going to leave a trace. What traces am I leaving behind? And do I need to talk to my forensics team or someone I know in forensics that can help me understand this is what this attack vector is leaving behind, this is how I can make my attacks better and become a better pen tester. 
right? So you truly begin to understand your trace evidence, how your actions are not in a vacuum, but you are leaving behind breadcrumbs for someone to find. And potentially that's what you want to do, right? Or in some cases, you know, your customer may say, no, I want you to be totally clandestine. Okay, now I can go to work. And I know what I'm doing because I know the traces I'm leaving behind. Right, a great example is, uh, uh, is deleting log files. Right, you delete log files, people think, oh, that's going to leave evidence that you deleted the log files. As an investigator, if I don't have log files to investigate, guess what I can't do? I can't figure out what you did because there's no log. So who cares if I know you deleted your logs because I now have no logs to figure out what you did? So understanding, I just removed all the evidence that that guy could use or that the security team can use to defend or whatever they're going to do, uh, it's, it's really key. Um, in addition, right, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And that's kind of a weird statement, but think about that for a second when we talked about the log deletion. Um, the other piece is analysis paralysis, and that's, that's kind of something that we run into in, in huge cases, right, where we, we see so much traffic being generated. We see so many attack vectors, so many pieces of malware that we don't know which one actually did the damage. Um, so again, that's kind of the other side of understanding what my trace evidence is, to know I could generate so much evidence that an investigator or a security team would have no idea where the real meat of it was because there's, they're going to spend six months combing through log files to find three lines of an actual attack. Okay, so really getting those key components uh, of what you do and how you do it. Okay. Um, and then in addition, right, so Understanding what the forensic evidence is, right? So if I run a port scan, what does it look like? What is that going to tell an investigator? Um, if I use an industry standard tool like Nmap or Nessus or Metasploit, is that a clear attack vector that someone like me is going to pull out and go, oh yeah, they use Metasploit here, they use this particular plugin, they use this particular feature? Um, using AV signatures, which is, is really you know, something Tim's going to talk about, um, but if you're using binaries to exploit a target, are there particular components of that binary that AV signatures are going to find and alert and your attack's not going to work? Um, and then SQL injection. Um, if you've ever attempted SQL injection or worked through those, they leave extraordinary uh, amounts of information in web logs. We can rebuild entire attack vectors through IIS logs or Apache logs and determine when you got in, what you did, you uploaded an uploader, you pulled in a web shell, you were able to exfiltrate data, and here's when you stopped on the system. I mean, I've got a clean picture of what took place. So really grasping that, knowing I know I'm going to generate this data, how can I either use that to my advantage or how do I, how do I get rid of it? Okay, so I'm going to let Tim take over. <coughs> So re returning to the notion of OP4 and uh, what I call uh, reverse OP4 is where your uh, incident responders are training your penetration testers, right, where your defenders are training your attackers. There's really a couple ways you can think about this happening. You could, um, you know, as Chris just walked through, look at all the particular points where data is left in the network and uh, you know, what does the, your incident responders, what are they able to tell you about what was left behind and maybe you can um, you know, take that into account and avoid that going forward. Uh, but also you could look for, to the incident response community to learn you know, what do black hats actually do, right? What are their behaviors, what are their methods of choice and could we adopt those more closely? So the way uh, I think about this as kind of, you know, CVSS for black hats, how do black hats choose exploits, and contrast that with how white hats choose, choose exploits. So this list here is kind of, you know, putting myself in the shoes of an uh, attacker and cross-referencing that with, you know, uh, chats that I've had with my friends in the incident response community. And these properties kind of uh, are top of mind. Um, safety, power, and visibility, frequency. So by safety, I mean, is it safe to launch this attack against the target, meaning is it safe to the target? So is this something that I can run with absolutely zero risk to the target system? As an attacker, there's two reasons why you want this. Um, first of all, if you knock a system over, you're going to ring a bell, and that's bad. And secondly, you want to be able to revisit this target, uh, perhaps you know, a month from now uh, or you know, over and over again, in the coming weeks, and so you really want to ensure the stability of the systems you're attacking. So I think that's key. 
Uh, power is simply the word I'm using for the leverage that the attack gives you. So it might not give you the, your end goal data, but maybe some data along the way. Um, it may put you in a privileged network position. It may get you some credentials. Invisibility is uh, straightforward. I'm just talking about stealth, detectability. And frequency is, is simply a measure of how common this vulnerability occurs, how the, the, the system that's vulnerable, how common is it in the wild. And now contrast that with how white hats choose exploits, or maybe uh, how they choose which exploits to defend against. So if you look at the various systems of metrics that we've put in place over the years, uh, I have some examples here. We all are familiar with Microsoft's rating systems. We've got critical, important, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the four um, uh, series of criticality. Uh, CERT has a complicated system of applying a variety of metrics to vulnerabilities and putting a score on them. And I think what's maybe more um, timely is uh, CVSS, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, which is uh, like an offshoot, I guess you could think of, uh, of, of CVE. And um, then I, I won't get into the particular metrics these things use, but uh, if you con contrast them to uh, the four that I just laid out that the black hats prioritize over, um, frequency is really the only thing that is shared amongst these which uh, I find kind of strange. I mean, uh, for example, stealth is completely ignored from what I can tell in the systems of metrics that are applied to vulnerabilities by folks that are defending against them. So what's the difference between these systems of metrics? Well. The white hat metrics are based on vulnerabilities and the black hats are based on attacks. And I mean both kind of the obvious distinction between a shift in focus from the defender to the attacker, but also I think uh, there's lurking here uh, a confusion around what is a vulnerability. If you spend, I've had the opportunity recently to spend a lot of time playing and just kind of digging in CVE data. It's not a lot of fun, but you get, I think if you spend a lot of time in that world, you get lulled into the fallacy that what is a vulnerability is that which can be patched. I mean, if you look at some of the obvious vulnerabilities that don't have CVEs, that's a common characteristic they have. They're not patchable. But this is obviously false, right? I can give you some syllogistic reasoning to prove that's not the case. Premise A, you can't patch stupidity. Premise B, you sure as hell can exploit it. Therefore, conclusion, things, uh, exploitable things exist which can't be patched. White hat metrics focus on largely public facing or internet facing uh, attack surfaces. But I don't think the black hats particularly care uh, in the grand scheme of things about internet facing systems. I mean that's stage one of a complicated or multi-stage attack is going to traverse the internet. But ultimately that's not where the data is, generally. I think it's uh, long overdue for us to renew or return or re-emphasize focus on internal network vulnerabilities. I think if there's one moral to be learned from last year's hack of RSA. It's this. We are all one phishing exercise away from an instance of backtrack on our network. And finally, the, uh, the white hat systems are unable to parse multi-stage attacks. And I think this is a critical failure. So if what's important about an attack is how you can take these small, low vulnerability bits and glue them together for a major compromise, then we really want our systems to be able to reflect that and deal with that. But there's no way you can take um, a vulnerability with a CVSS score of one and another vulnerability with a CVSS score of two and say, well, what's the vulnerability of 
the one plus the other. It's, the systems just can't handle that. But as attackers, that's what we do. So just to briefly go back and illustrate my point about the difference between CVEs and what's vulnerable. This is just my artist's rendition. And keep in mind that as of yesterday, there were over, well over 48,000 items in the CVE database. So if we take these things into account, the kinds of traces that we leave on internal networks that forensics can pick out, and the methods adopted by attackers, and apply those, we get what I call real-world penetration testing, where we have some new goals. Stealth becomes a primary goal. The demonstration of multi-stage attacks, full on to data exfiltration from the network. The use of blended methods, so blurring boundaries between external, internal attacks, and in fact showing how they naturally lead one into the other. And where appropriate, the use of the Black Hat's methods and tools of choice. So this is a graphic that you may be familiar with if you've ever used the Metasploit framework. It's near and dear to the hearts of penetration testers the world over. Uh, and this is one of the splash screens you get, right, when you fire up the Metasploit console. I heart shells. Well, I think this, uh, I picked this out. I think it serves as a nice little representative graphic of the difference between where we've been going and where I want to go. To me, this, is, this was all cool and fun, but it's kind of like Beavis and Butthead do penetration testing. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. So get your virtual schmoo balls ready. Black hats don't hurt shells. They don't. They hurt credit card numbers. They hurt product designs. They hurt RSA secrets. They hurt data that can be commoditized. Now, um, if you do heart shells, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, how do we get here? Why, why do we want penetration testing to more closely model real world attacks? I mean, they're different. They're always going to be different, right? Well, yeah, I agree. They are always going to be different. We don't want them to be identical. But I want to push what we're doing closer to the real world scenario. And I think we get a few things from that. Um, uh, if nothing else, we're going to have some more accurate data to give to our incident responders. So if for no other reason, it's a good training exercise. Um, I think it will refocus issues back to the data, which is where we want them to be. That's really where the issue is. And, um, Finally, I think it is going to help us break down some of those barriers I talked about. As a workaday penetration tester, one of your most common frustrations is inappropriate scoping or inappropriate restrictions on scope. You're told you can't look at these systems over here, you can't look at this network layer over here, um, you know, client sides out of scope, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, if we can focus on at least the kind of uh, blow up the reconnaissance stage of our work and include those uh, going after those vulnerabilities that are safe to attack and provide power, leverage, invisibility, and so on, um, we're going to get into a situation where we can negotiate with our clients to expand scope in more reasonable ways. All right, if I can do additional work against systems with a very high degree of confidence that I'm not going to impact them, 
and uh, you know maybe work out some other arrangements where any kind of risky exploit attempts are never going to be surprised. Clients are always going to be notified in advance. Right? We can start to break these boundaries down and expand our scope to be more like the black hat scope. So I've done a little bit of work in this space in terms of just gluing together um, simple utilities that we use all the time. Um, really this, um, you know, what got me thinking along these lines was looking at all the kinds of vulnerabilities that we exploit on a day-to-day -day basis and trying to figure out, well, which ones do we use most frequently and why? And uh, as a result, at the end of that exercise, I had a, a list of things that I you know, I know work regularly, and I know are safe and can be run all the time. And then it hit me: well, if, if they if they're safe and they're valuable, then they should be automated. I mean, why why do it any other way? So I have utilities I can run now where I get dropped on an internal network, and while I'm drinking my coffee, I get domain admin rights. In you know, when I'm lucky, but I mean, you'd you'd be surprised how often that is. Um, this isn't to say that you know automation is is our end goal or anything, but you know uh, we're lazy, right? And so whenever you can use it, use it. It helps you accomplish more with the limited time and resources that you have. So this is mine. Um, we're going to talk about a, a, a second success story that's um, in which we've worked with with. Forensics and pen testing kind of simultaneously. And, and what's really unique about that is um, you get a really cool perspective of what's going on on the network real time. It's not someone else's report. It's not, hey, we did this pen test like a year ago, and this is like what we found. But we get to do real things. So we're doing one right now. And I'm sorry, if you don't know what JTF means, it stands for Joint Task Force. Um, I'm, I'm, the military is just as bad about acronyms as IT is. So you put the two of them together, and like, it's amazing we can complete full sentences. But so it's a current JTF mission that we're working. Um, again, the, the whole concept is train as you fight. So we convince this customer that has really, really valuable data, turn our pen testers loose. Don't put, don't put gloves on them. Don't put boundaries on them. Let them attack the way a real world attacker would. Because what, in, in investigations, we break it down into three components, right? We call that the breach triad. Bad guys got to get in. Bad guys got to have something to steal. Bad guys got to get out. Right, so an attacker, a real world attacker, is not gonna look to exploit every vulnerability or look to find every threat vector that's there, right? They're gonna find the shortest distance between them and the data that's of value. So when we pitched this to the customer, we said, let us just go after your data. Don't tell us where it's at, but we're gonna come in and come out as stealthily as possible. We're gonna extract that data and we're gonna hand it to you and say, here's, here's how you got owned. And then after we do that, we're gonna come back again and try to do it. So my position on that, right, is to then take those indicators of compromise and to look at the customer in, uh, information, look at log files, look at disk images, and say, did this take place prior to our pen testing team exploiting that vulnerability? And if it did, y'all are in big trouble. If it didn't, OK, then that's cool. So the pen testing team, in theory, should be able to come in, exploit something, get to the, you know, get to the valuable data. We look at that from a forensics uh, you know, perspective, look at the indicators of compromise and go, okay, this is dated during the pen test, that's good, next item. But if we see one that predates the pen test, then that's, that's pretty scary. And it's a great example of how pen testing and forensics can work together to really help, uh, you know, provide a unique value uh, to our customers, right? And um, so with regarding pen testing as, as op four, you know, what can incident responders practice gain from additional feedback from pen testers? Right, so if you guys are in the pen test community and, and, and you're doing the same exploits over and over again, and I ask, and I ask Tim, and I ask five or six other guys on my pen test team, you know, what do you guys use? What's, you know, what's your go-to bag? Every time I get on a network and I see a Windows 2003 server, I use this. Every time I see a Windows XP box, I use this. Is there a common bag, right, of, of exploits and, and, uh, and tools that you use that then I can look at and go, okay, if these pen testers are using them, chances are everybody's using them, right? If five or six people kind of say the same thing over and over, then can I establish indicators of compromise for those five or six things? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
That is a great question. So basically, is there like a CVE database for indicators of compromise for forensics? The answer is no, there's not. You have to pretty much figure it out on your own. I don't know if that has to do with the infancy of uh, forensics and incident response. I, I don't know if that has to do with people don't want to share their secret sauce. Is it a competitive edge that I know how to find these IOCs and you don't? I, I don't know. But if there is one out there, I'm not aware of it. Open IOC. Open IOC, he says. So, uh, so check that out. Um, but again, that is, am I willing to share IOCs? And which IOCs am I willing to share? And is it making the community better? Or is it meaning I get to keep my secret sauce and my team is better than your team? Totally off topic, but it's a good question. Um, so I take those IOCs, I build them into my uh, investigation methodology, so then I can come into a certain penetration and say, look, I know my guys have worked these pen tests in the past. Here's the IOCs that I've seen with tools that they use to accomplish these goals. Let's compare those against the IOCs that are present on the customer system, and is it something I can knock out that much faster, right? And is it something that I've currently overlooked? You know, do I think that I'm the be-all and end-all of forensic investigations, and there's nothing new for me to learn? Believe it or not, there's lots and lots of investigators that think that way, that think there's, you know, there's nothing that NCASE can't do, or there's nothing that FTK can't do. And, and understanding, look, it's got nothing to do with that. It's how do you interpret evidence? What's the trace evidence left behind? And what direction does that point you logically with regards to what took place and what didn't? Um, so is something being overlooked, right? I, I don't know, because if I'm overlooking it, I have no idea if it's there. But if it's a common uh, attack vector that pen testers all over are using, duh, it would make a whole lot of sense for me as an investigator to know what those most common elements are. Right. So then the micro lessons, right, for what logs include, you know, the trace elements of common pen test activities, right? We talked about SQL injections in IIS and Apache logs. What about, uh, you know, Windows event logs? What about VAR log? I mean, what is left behind when you log into a system with a shell? What's left behind if you log into a system from the command line? What's left behind if you fire up a PHP shell? There will be trace elements and just understanding what those are. Where did pen text activity leave traces on disk? Are you making modifications to the registry that you have no idea that you're making modifications to? Is there a specific hive and a specific key that each time you do X is updating that key? If it's a Windows box, right, a newer release, is it creating a shadow volume copy that traces your data? Or is it, you know, the older version, right, XP restore points? You know, all of that stuff is there and you may not even know you're creating that evidence. And for me, I need to know what evidence it is that you're creating. So you see how the two can really converge and you could really get good at, at what it is that you do based on the, the, the feedback you can get from the other side of the coin, right? Or did AV signatures or IDS signatures fire? Did they not fire? Can they be improved through automation, through, through, in, through uh, adding IOCs that are common, you know, into those, you know, into those signatures? And then again, understanding white noise and analysis paralysis. Can you generate so much traffic that an investigator is going to look at that and go, I've got four terabytes of logs and I'm going to kill myself looking through that, right? Can you, can you really create a situation where there's so much to analyze, there's nothing to analyze, right? And then the, uh, and then the macro lessons, what can be learned um, from a new appreciation of the most common attack patterns, right? Can I add that into my investigative methodology and, and just become that much better and that much more efficient and come to conclusions that much faster? Or I get that piece, right, that critical component at the, on st or the beginning stages of the investigation that will lead me in the right direction, right? And then what are the most likely forms of evidence that are left behind in those patterns we've talked about? And then based on that, can we improve efficiency and effectiveness? Well, yeah, because now I know what I'm looking for. I'm not magically looking around hoping to find evil. I know exactly what it's going to look like because I've done research. I've worked with pen tests. I've done proof of concept exercises, and I know what it is that I'm going after, right? I'm not crossing my fingers hoping to find evil. I know what evil looks like, and if it's there, I'll find it. So we're talking about another success story. This is through SQL injection. We kind of keep talking about this because it's kind of, uh, believe it or not, this is really a popular attack vector. There's lots and lots and lots of folks out there that still don't do proper input validation and their code is terrible and SQL injection is a great attack vector. Um, so we had a particular attack pattern, right? Because a lot of WAFs will, will detect, you know, Varkar and declare statements and cast statements and they pick it up so the SQL injection isn't successful. But what we've seen attackers do is either base64 encode those or um, use uh, hex encoding so that the whole SQL string is hex encoded. Well, if they're not doing proper input validation, who cares if they get 50 characters or 50,000 characters, right? Because it's not going to know the difference. It's still going to pass the query back. 
Well, we saw a particular pattern. Like I said, I'm not an expert in technology. I'm an expert at spotting anomalies and, and, and um, uh, consistencies, and this was an anomaly. And I said, man, I have absolutely no idea what this is. I think it's encoded somehow. I, I kind of thought it was base 64, but I wasn't sure. So I passed it to one of the pen testers, and I said, hey, can you help me figure this out? I think this is base 64. Can you look at this string and, and, and tell me what you think it is? And he took a look at it, and he goes, yeah, absolutely. Wrote me <laughs> a decoder, right, to translate it from base 64 into, you know, into standard text, and then showed me the attack string. Here's where this is doing this. Here's this part of the SQL injection, here's the next part, here's what he did, here, here, and here. Well now, right now I have this whole investigation blown wide open because I know exactly what I'm looking for. I can go through the logs, I can pull out that IP address, uh, and actually, you know, none of this done with forensic software, right? This is all command line. So I can, I can carve out that information, pull out the IP addresses associated with that activity, fire that through the decoder that he wrote me, and pull out the whole attack string. It was awesome. We did that, and after we figured that component out, it was like two hours worth of work. It was great. But it's a great example of how that reachback capability can really give you an effective edge on, on solving your investigations. That what? Yeah, well, it's an example, too, so I wasn't going for that specifically. But good point. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, just moving on, um, another success story is we have something called uh, incident, uh, incident ready to investigate, um, aka incident in a can. I kind of like Tim's uh, example a little bit better. Um, but basically what it is is service offering that we have that if an organization says, look, we really want to get good at defending our network, and our network is unique in this way, right? Everybody thinks that they're unique, um, and their data is, is, is more valuable than the next guy's. So they say, look, we want to defend our data. Here's what our network looks like. Can you develop a scenario from soup to nuts to show us how is the best way to defend our network? So what we can do is generate a mock network exercise with, with target hosts, with target data, with custom malware, et cetera, that says, look, go after you know, this specific data, identify it, exfiltrate it, then give us all the evidence and let our incident response team come through that and see if we can find it. So it's, it's kind of where we get incident in a can, right? We can prepare it any way they wanted. This particular one was, was really cool, really effective, um, and it brought all of the components. It brought our malware research team in to develop malware, the incident response team to help develop the scenario that would be built around it, as well as the pen testers that wrote the custom exploits that would be used to, to, uh, um, you know, to conduct the exercise. So really cool way to bring everybody together to offer a really unique service that uh, is, is really successful. Right, so in conclusion, right, op four, um, you know, traditionally is, is pen testers training incident responders, right? It's you guys doing what you do best and us kind of picking up the details going, oh, here's where they did this, here's where they did this, here's where they did this. Um, but like Tim said, there's a way to turn that around and make it just as effective for pen testers to get good at what they do based on what folks like me, you know, will look for and, and, and try to identify both in logs and in, you know, residual data on the disk. Did you want to add anything about that? As I spoke about, I think it's time for a taxonomy reboot. Um, the <clears throat> systems built around CVE, CVSS, and friends need to um, take another look from the attacker's perspective so that um, we can accommodate attacks that focus on internal networks um, that uh, can be, you know, chained together in complicated ways um, so that you can show examples of significant compromise resulted from um, low, what would otherwise be thought of as low risk vulnerabilities. <clears throat> and uh, finally, uh, we traditionally think of the OP4 exercise as being a training exercise for particular people. But I would like to envision rolling this up where we are actually training whole communities of people. So think about what the incident response community can be providing in mass to the penetration testing community in mass and vice versa. Thank you. Yeah, so, is that not, so absolutely, you know, thank you for your time. Uh, does anyone have any questions? We've got a few minutes here. Um, 
It's all crystal clear. No one has any questions. Okay, great. I